Good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Laszlo Montgomery here with the penultimate episode in our series that sort of, kind of, offered you a little overview of the history of poetry in the Tang Dynasty. I think we've lingered long enough in the High Tang and that we might move on to the Middle Tang period. This is the post Anlushan Rebellion era. All the greats who are revered today and who we previously discussed in past episodes, Li Bai, Du Fu, Wang Wei, Meng Hao Ran, they were all gone. And the emperor too, whose Kaiyuan era name defined those times that, among other accolades, was called China's golden age of poetry. Emperor Xuanzong, he too, by 762, was gone. Around the year 772, Bai Ju Yi was born, another Tang poet beloved throughout the ages for his particular style of poetry or for what he stood for. He, like Du Fu and others I mentioned, had a pretty strong social conscience that didn't go over too well with the establishment. He wanted to give the common people a better deal than what they had traditionally gotten from Chinese society. I have friends who will swear he was the greatest. Bai Ju Yi has a lot of fans among the cognoscenti. He was born in Taiyuan, in the very same Shanxi province as Wang Wei, but spent his early years in southern Hunan. He came from a poor but educated family, and his father was a minor cog in the government bureaucracy. There was an old saying, I've mentioned it before, Zou Guan Fa Cai, attain riches through working in the government. Well, that didn't apply to everyone, and certainly not to the Bai family. Just like Li Bai is also called Li Bo, same deal with Bai Ju Yi. You'll also see him referred to in more than a few sources as Bo Ju Yi. Like a lot of aspiring sons of ambitious parents, he was sent north to sit for the Jin Shi exams. The only ticket to the big time in those days and for centuries thereafter. Bai Ju Yi passed in 800, and like the rest of the poets I mentioned in this series, he worked in and around the capital, Chang'an. In the early part of his career, he did well. I mentioned in that Li Bai episode that Bai Ju Yi was also appointed to the prestigious Hanlin Academy. 807 to 815, he served at the imperial court as reminder on the left, as opposed to the right, the post held by both Du Fu and Wang Wei back in their day. So he, he wasn't some lower or middle-ranked official like his father. In Chinese, he had two nicknames, the Shi Wang and the Shi Mo, the poet king and the poet magician. Bai Ju Yi was also called the people's poet. I read, if there was one single character in his poetry that couldn't be understood by the people, literate or illiterate, he revised it. He advocated for plain, no-frills poetry that didn't require a formal Confucian education to understand and said what it said and didn't hide behind all the poetry speak that could mean any number of things in classical Chinese. Bai Ju Yi liked to keep it simple. He was a contemporary of Han Yu, the great statesman and prose master. Han Yu still wrote in that old style that would be familiar to anyone with a traditional education. Bai Ju Yi parted ways with this style, and he believed the poetry should avoid being too highfalutin for the masses. So when his poetry wandered into the realm of the political, he got swatted down. Some of his poems got too close to the nerve endings, and after he had overstepped his bounds on some issues, uh, in the year 815, Bai got himself exiled to Zhoujiang, Jiangxi province. I haven't been there, but I heard it's beautiful. But in the 9th century, Zhoujiang was pretty far from all the action, and so this wasn't what you'd call a much sought-after assignment. He also got sent to another location in Sichuan, and I'm not talking Chengdu or Chongqing. That's how they did it in ancient China. If an official got on someone's wrong side, but didn't commit too heinous a crime, he got sent out to work at these places. And the farther from the capital they were, usually the less attractive they were to the official being sent to serve there. Bai Ju's period of exile ended in 819, and he was recalled back to the capital, Chang'an, 
And after a few rough years serving in Luoyang and then to Suzhou, he was sent to the city of Hangzhou to serve as prefect, you know, like the governor. He was a more than capable leader and left Hangzhou in much better shape than when he first got there. One legendary improvement credited to Bai Yi during his uh, Hangzhou period was the construction of a causeway. You all know the Su Di on uh, Westlake, the Su Causeway. I walked it many times. Built during the time of the Northern Song when Su Shi was serving there. Well, by the 9th century, way before Su Shi's time, Westlake was in bad shape and had fallen into a very degraded state. The upshot being the local peasants, who depended on the lake for their livelihood, suffered. So Bai Ju Yi called for repairs to the dikes and for this causeway to be built into the lake. It was called the Bai Gong Di, named for Bai Ju Yi. Don't bother looking for it because it isn't there anymore. There is a Bai Sha Di that was built later on and became known simply as the Bai Di, the Bai Causeway, to honor Bai Ju Yi and the good deeds he did for the people while serving in Hangzhou. Some say it was Bai Ju Yi who gave West Lake its name. Two of his poems referred to the lake by this name, and during the Northern Song, it officially became West Lake. But Shi Hu, some say this magical name for this beautiful and historic lake, came from Bai Ju Yi. So he served there from 825 to 827, and then went back to Chang'an for a stretch. But he had become ill over the years and suffered various maladies that you know, slowed him down. In his final years, he built a place for himself right on the Yi He, the Yi River, where the Longmen Grottoes are, the Longmen Shirku, just south of Luoyang. That's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, I'll have you know. In fact, Bai Ju Yi's tomb is located right there at the site of the Longmen Grottoes. So, next time you're there, on the east bank of the Yihe River, there's the Baiyuan, or White Park. And you could go pay your respects and visit Bai Ju Yi's tomb. So Bai Ju Yi, he had a nice government career. He believed the rules of society didn't apply to his case and did things his way, where he saw injustice he used his fame to speak out. Sometimes he didn't get into any trouble. Sometimes he did. He was famous in his own day, all throughout China. Instant gratification in Bai Ju Yi's case. None of this waiting uh, half a century before people started to appreciate his work. And he had quite a business going, selling his poems. He compiled his own collection of 2,840 poems called the Bai Shi. Chang Qingqi, Bai Juyi's best friend and literary comrade who he was most associated with, was named Yuan Zhen. I'll just quickly mention him. He was a heavy hitter in the Tang government for two decades, serving briefly for four months as chancellor under Emperor Mu Zong. He came from royalty, claiming his family could trace their ancestry to the Northern Wei kings who reigned during the Northern and Southern Dynasties period. And he had four of his poems included in the 300 Tang Poems collection. Yuan Zhen was also the first notable figure in the Tang to place Du Fu on an exalted pedestal. And he wouldn't be the last, as we'll see. But these two, Bai Ju Yi and Yuan Zhen, they collaborated and became known for a style of writing known as Yuan He Ti, Yuan He Style after the era name of the Xianzong Emperor. Very stripped down, no frills or schmaltz added, heavy on the vernacular and considered by many to be a bit vulgar, yet still maintaining a whiff of the ancient styles. And these two friends are also associated with a style of poetry that became known as the New Yuefu. You might remember the Yuefu of the Han Dynasty, Emperor Wu. I spoke about this earlier in part two. The Music Bureau and the poems in the style of this bureau. This new Yuefu form was revived in the Tang. Bai Ju Yi is the poet most associated with it, although uh, Li Bai and others also composed Yuefu uh, style poetry. 
in repackaging some of the old Yafu works, these poets spoke out against injustice and corruption, but in a way so subtle and indirect, no one could say anything. But if you listen to the poem, you know what they were talking about. Bai Ju Yi and Yuan Chan did much to fan the flames of popularity of this 8th century version of this 1st century BCE style of poetry. They both served together in Chang'an between 803 and 810. Yuan Chan had a nice, long, and successful career intermixed with periods of banishment. He had done very well as a literary figure and was also celebrated in his day. Yuan and Bai Ju Yi, just like Li Bai and Du Fu, kept up a famous correspondence, always exchanging poems. I mentioned the Mu Zong Emperor and that Yuan Zhan served as a high-ranking official in his court. Well, this emperor was a big fan of his work. During the 820s, Yuan Zhan enjoyed a bit of shine, which of course created all kinds of controversy from his political rivals. I guess... I guess that's a common theme in Chinese history. It seems very few officials who served the emperor at his court managed to get through their career without some sort of setback. Yuan Zhan was no exception. His career was filled with great praise and derision for various acts of arrogance and greed. Well, let's just call him controversial. His most famous work well, it isn't even a poem, it's a short story called Ying Ying Zhuang, The Tale of the Oriole. This was Yuan Zhan's masterpiece and is also considered one of the more important works of literature to come out of the whole Tang Dynasty. So despite a classic rocky road serving in the government, Yuan Zhan was renowned for his writing and he was always mentioned in discussing Bai Ju Yi. These two bosom buddies, Yuan Zhen and Bai Ju Yi, they had made a vow early on called the Green Mountain Pact, and they swore that as soon as they could swing it, they'd leave the battleground of the imperial government and retire to some remote location and live a Taoist life as recluses. But Yuan Zhen died in 831, 15 years before Bai Ju Yi, so it wasn't meant to be. And after both men passed on, those who loved and respected their work referred to them as Yuanbai, joining together the, the characters of their surnames. To say you loved Yuanbai poetry was to say you loved the poetry of Yuan Zhen and Bai Ju Yi. Bai Ju Yi's two most famous poems, I guess most famous, is his Chang Chen Ge, The Song of Everlasting Sorrow. I'd read it for you, but it's 120 verses. This poem tells the story of Emperor Xuanzong and Yang Guifei. You could say this poem, written in 809, 53 years after Yang Guifei was strangled in 756, perhaps more than anything else, stoked the early legend of that most tragic story of Xuanzong and Yang Guifei that went on to inspire countless other literary and artistic works. I bet a few movies and operas as well. It was written during Bai Ju Yi's Chang'an period when he served up there with Yuan Zhen. The other renowned work of Bai Ju Yi might be The Song of the Pipa Player, Pipa Xing. At 616 characters, again, too long for this episode. Bai Ju Yi wrote this poem during his Jiujiang period when he had been demoted and served there as an official. It was written for a woman whose pipa playing had attracted Bai Ju Yi, and he invited her one evening to come play for him. And he was touched by her sorrowful story and wrote this poem for her, this unnamed woman who had, like Bai Ju Yi, found herself in Jiujiang after leaving the sophistication and pleasures of the capital. Due to circumstances, she had married unwillingly beneath her station to a merchant and lamented to Bai Chu Yi of this sad fate she now lived. He was able to relate to her, being in a somewhat similar situation at the time, and immortalized her with this poem. Let's read a couple of uh, Bai Chu Yi's shorter poems. 
Uh, this one isn't one of his greatest, but it's one of Bai Chuyi's most famous. Here he sort of goofs on Lao Tzu. It's called Du Lao Tzu, Reading Lao Tzu. And it goes like this. The old gentleman he refers to in the poem is Lao Tzu. Yan zhe, bu ru zhi zhe mo. Ci yu, wu wen yu lao jun. Ruo dao lao jun shi zhi zhe. Yuan he zi zhe, wu qian wen. Those who speak do not know. Those who know are silent. I heard this saying from the old gentleman. If the old gentleman was one who knew the way, why did he feel able to write 5,000 words? A slight jab to Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching, a work that weighed in at about 5,000 characters. If he who knows should say nothing, well, that ran contrary to what he said about those who knew. They should say nothing. Yet he, Lao Tzu, a man who knew, he had a lot to say. Bai Zhu Yi, having some fun with this poem at Lao Tzu's expense. Here's a poem he wrote for his closest friend and literary companion, Yuan Zhen, called Seeing Yuan Zhen's Poem at Blue Ridge Station. Lan Qiao Yi, Jian Yuan Jiu Shi. Yuan Jiu was another name of Yuan Zhen. Goes like this. Lan Qiao Chun Xue Jun Gui Ri, Qin Ling Qiu Feng Wo Chu Shi, Mei Dao Yi Ting Xian Xia Ma. Xun Qiang Rao Zhu Mi Jun Shi. Blue Ridge, Spring Snow, The Day You Went Away. Qin Hills, Autumn Wind, The Day I Did the Same. At every station, when I dismount, the first thing I do is check the walls and pillars for a poem of yours. When Bai Zhu Yi died in 846, the Tang Emperor Xuanzong wrote a poem in his honor, praising him by saying that his name lives on forever because the little children knew how to recite the Song of Everlasting Sorrow, and the old people could sing the Song of the Pipa Player. When looking at the Middle Tang period of classical poetry, the three most prominent figures are perhaps Bai Zhu Yi, Yuan Zhan, and Xue Tao. They all knew each other and were part of this talented core of literati who were, in all three of their lifetimes, well known throughout the land. We already took a quick look at Bai Zhu Yi and Yuan Zhan. Let's now spend a few minutes getting to know Xue Tao. She was something else. Xue Tao, among her many distinctions, Chinese history has called her both the Tang Dai Si Da Nyu Cai Zhi Yi, one of the top four female talents of the Tang, and the Shu Zhong Si Da Nyu Cai Zhi Yi, one of the top four female talents of Sichuan. She lived around 768 to 831, contemporary with the two men I've introduced so far. I keep giving you these dates that are not quite exact. No one up till now has been able to produce, uh, you know, the birth certificate of many of these famous poets, but we know approximately when they lived and died, and, you know, that's good enough for me. There were several female poets of note from this Tang period, but Xue Tao, I think I'm not out of line saying, was the most famous, perhaps along with uh, Yu Xuanji. Quite an interesting life story, in addition to the popularity of her work. Like so many stories of renowned scholars and literary figures, there are legends recorded that attest to Xue Tao as being one of those gifted child prodigies, already composing serious poetry at eight years old. Her father was an official serving in Chang'an when she was born. However, he was sent to serve in the city of Chengdu, and it's in this city, Chengdu, where Xue Tao's story takes place. Her childhood and early years are full of commentary, but not too many facts that we could hang our hats on. Growing up in the family she did, Xue Tao received an early education and showed a lot of talent. But, you know, 8th century China, the career path for women, you know, wasn't what it is today. Her father died when she was still young, and without this breadwinner around anymore, she ended up being registered with the Guild of Courtesans and Entertainers. Courtesans were trained in providing 
paying customers with witty and enjoyable conversation, playing music, and reciting poetry. Sort of like a Japanese geisha. Prostitutes and courtesans were not the same. Although sexual services were part of a courtesan's bag of tricks, their main job description was to entertain. It didn't take long before she became very much in demand. Despite any woman's great talents or abilities, back then the only way to really make it in the world was to have some man standing behind her who could provide a platform for her to display her talents. And Xue Tao was no exception. The man in her life was named Wei Gao. He was the military governor of Xichuan, the administrative region around Sichuan province based in Chengdu. He was one of the more successful generals in the history of the Tang Wars with the Tibetan Empire and later the Nanjiao Kingdom. She caught his eye and before long, in her late teens in 785, Wei Gao made Xue Tao his official hostess. Now, in a position such as this, Xue Tao was able to mix with a lot of VIPs who passed through this southwest part of China. And Chengdu had always been a place of exquisite culture, going back to the ancient times of the Shu Kingdom. Still is today, in fact. So she did quite well and thrived. It didn't take long before word spread about Xue Tao and her poetry. Men dominated in the government, and of course the military. Well, I guess you could say the same thing today in the PRC, 12 centuries later. And not just that, in the arts and letters as well. It was heavily a man's world. That's one reason Xue Tao was able to attract so many fans of her work. The history books... Don't mention her beauty or anything much about her physical being. It was her talent that made Xue Tao stand out. This was why other poets, such as Bai Ju Yi, were so attracted to her. After her benefactor, Wei Gao, passed in 805, she reinvented herself and for the next quarter century lived a quiet and reclusive life. He had left her a considerable sum to live off for the rest of her days. Reclusive she was, but she remained a major figure in the Chengdu literary scene. Yuan Zhan, 11 years her junior, it was said, became one of her lovers. She had plenty of admirers, too. But a lot has been written that says Xue Tao and Yuan Zhan had a long and passionate relationship. In her own lifetime, she compiled a collection of 450 poems called the Jin Jiang Ji. The Brocade River Collection. Jin means brocade. The Jinjiang is the river that flows through the middle of Chengdu. One of Chengdu's nicknames is the Brocade City because of this river. Of the 450 poems contained in this collection, less than 100 survive to our day. The Brocade River Collection, the Jinjiang Ji, it's one of those works that got lost over the centuries, but had been talked about in many sources. In the Quan Tang Shi, the complete book of Tang poetry, one of the Kangxi Emperor's trophy compilations, you can find 89 of her poems. She was quite prolific, it's said, producing over 5,000 poems and songs during her lifetime. One other cool thing about Xie Tao was that she played a pretty significant role in launching the papermaking industry in Chengdu, she invented a kind of paper that became known as Xue Tao Jian. Jian means writing paper. She created this personal stationery not only for herself to write her poems on, but for others as well. It's been called the first ever personal stationery of its kind and came in a kind of pinkish color due to the hibiscus flowers that she used in its manufacture. Although none of this Xue Tao Jian paper survived the 12 centuries that have passed since her time, it was written about a great deal. She lived out her last years as a Taoist nun and passed sometime around 831. There were only seven more decades of life left in the Tang Dynasty by then. As a poet, 
calligrapher, and inventor who lived an independent life and did what she pleased. She made a name for herself in her own time and for all the years that followed and into our day. And if you find yourself in Chengdu, after you've grooved on Du Fu's thatched hut, the Du Fu Cao Tang, it's a mere half-hour drive over to the Wangjiang Lo Gong Yuan, the Wangjiang Tower Park, where you can go visit the Xue Tao Memorial Hall and pay your respects at her tomb. Let me read a couple of her poems, and then we could wrap things up and call it a day. Here's one called Casual Lovers, Yuanyang Cao. Lü Ying Man Xiang Qi, Liang Liang, Yuan Yang Xiao, Dan Yu Chun Ri Zhang, Bu Guan Chiu Feng Zhao. This green harrow fills me with his scent. Again and again we briefly join in love. Long days of passion are only a diversion, ignoring how soon it will grow cold between us. And this is one she wrote for her alleged lover, Yuan Zhen, who she refers to in the poem as Yuan Wei And it's called Song Lao Shi He Yuan Wei Sending an old style poem to Yuan Wei Zhi. Shi Pian Diao Tai Ren Jie Yo. Xi Ni Feng Guang Wo Du Zhi. Yue Xia Yong Hua Lian An Dan. Yu Zhao. Chanting a poem with attitude, anyone can do. Exquisite scenery, I alone understand. Beneath the moon, chanting flowers cherish the quiet dark, and rainy mornings, inscribed upon the willows, make me sigh. We've long been taught that Jasper lies in deepest depths. All my women's writings I've written in my own way. Big shots don't get to decide what is worth keeping, and you can stick to teaching men. Xue Tao, everyone, one of the greats from this middle... Tang period. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you enjoyed this episode. I think we'll finish things off next time in part eight when we look at the poets from the late Tang period. A nice, miserable age from Chinese history will feature, of course, the most famous name from that time, Li Shang Yin. Do join us for this grand finale coming to you in a mere two weeks' time. Until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery coming to you from the City of Angels, Los Angeles, California. Please, please do consider coming back one more time for possibly another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.